All right, we're going right now, Judge Salinas. Okay, it's six thirty-two. I hope everyone's okay with me starting the meeting now. Uh, good after, good evening, everybody. I'm going to call the meeting to order. The regular uh, meeting of the board is now called to order. Angie, can we have a roll call, please? Yes, Mr. Biederman. Present. Dr. Jett. Here. Dr. Matata. Present. And Judge Salinas. Present. We do have a quorum. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, the chair, okay, the chair recognizes the quorum. Um, we are going to have an introduction to our poet, poet laureate. Uh, is Miss York here? Or is she? Yes, I'm here. Hey, welcome. How are Hi. you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good. The floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Judge Salinas. I'm going to go ahead and introduce her first. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And we're going to let her begin. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, Ms. Hayes. My apologies. Oh, no problem. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, January York, who is a phenomenal uh, local poet. And she has been selected as the CBLC Poet Laureate. And this is the first time we've ever had someone uh, in this position for the CBLC. And we're so excited about what she's going to be able to do. Some of the things that uh, January is working on right now, she is on the verge of completing her Master's in Arts for Positive Psychology of which she has developed a poetry activity book for well-being that is dedicated to the empowerment of African-American mental health. And also, she's going to be releasing her first full-length book of poetry and essays entitled Noma D, released by VK Press. And uh, this is a Black woman-led publishing company, and it's expected uh, to be released uh, late spring or early summer. So we're excited about having that uh, in our system, and especially in the CBLC, and for her to talk more about that. And so without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Ms. January York. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. And I'm so excited to be the CBLC uh, first poet laureate. This is like it, it just, it means so much to me. I, I'm not even going to try to put it into words because I'll start rambling and I don't want to do that and take over your meeting. But thank you all for having me again and for giving me um, some of your time tonight. Um, and as she said, uh, as Michelle said, my um, book is coming out this spring, summer. I actually just had a text message from my publisher. So we're kind of... Um, we're right where we're supposed to be on things with that. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm going to read a poem tonight. Since it is still National Women's um, International Women's History Month, I have selected to do a poem that I wrote about my grandmother. Um, this poem is called Sweet Winona, but it is also, in addition to being um, kind of like my ode to my grandmother, it's also kind of an ode to grandmothers in general. Um, so I hope you all enjoy it. And again, I thank you for your time and I look forward to everything that this position will bring. Um, so here we go. To the grandmothers who were first mothers or better yet women, girls, daughters, to the daughters who blossomed into women turned mothers who saw a new generation of their uterine holdings crescendo into this world, thank you for your sacrifice to the grandmothers or to the daughters who didn't know what their future held but knew it didn't include the word back. The ones who helped pick greens and snap the peas and the ones who ran up red clay hills scraping pretty brown knees. Mama said you couldn't go to church like that after putting a hole in your new Easter dress to you. I say, thank you for not being afraid to walk around with a scuff or two to the grandmothers who were first mothers or better yet daughters, young women, young girls who were told not to let the tub water out. Siblings had to bathe and the outhouse ain't have much supply for separation. She who learned to kick rocks and whistle while standing in the rain without a care in her brain until a voice yelled her name from the crickety front porch steps. Get your behind in this house before I come outside with my belt. Thank you for not being afraid of the water to the grandmothers or the daughters who didn't cry when they picked the switch off the Delta Mississippi tree, who stood tall in front of parental caskets, ready to spearhead the rest of her siblings growth, to the daughters who ran down dirt roads, hiding from the clan while two pigtails shook loose on both the left and the right, 
who listened for safe silence and read books on the bunks they were hidden in to the daughters, the surviving daughters who saw moonlight as daylight and sunshine as running time, sweet molasses smiles and knicker knockers on. Thank you for learning how to keep a tight grip to the grandmothers who were once daughters turned into mothers who watched their lineage increase, the grandmothers who shied away from robes and aprons, who walked around barefoot on concrete, collected Cadillacs and gold rings, who loved Inquirer newspapers and little trinket things, to the grandmothers who didn't say I love you enough, but loved us more than we could handle, to the ones who broke tradition and did it their way, the grandmothers, the grand mirrors, who broke hearts and mended shoes, played jazz and the blues and never met a stranger that couldn't use more love, grandeur principles who snuck us candy and Pepsi while snickering at their frustrated daughters for the first word we spoke while sitting on your lap. We are in this instance, I thank you for the hot water cornbread and the smell of bacon in the electric skillet, for the oven used as a cabinet, for the soft baked cookies and the lemon cakes baked over your laughter, for the pea shake trips and the card games, the cigarette smoke, the remembered names, the smell of your house and the sound of your musical voice that rasp, that rasp that never stopped your choice to speak and speak again, for the times you let us call you your first name, for letting us call you grandmother, for being our grandma, our G-mom, our grandmere, thank you, for being born and never giving up even when the raisins in the sun dried up. Thank you for our mothers who you carried and cradled into carrying and cradling us. Now we carry and cradle our own, turning our mothers into you until we are turned into her. We generational purses, bag lady, don't you miss your cloud. Thank you for hanging down here with us. Thank you for the grandiose experience of your love, no matter how abundant, missing, or thinly wired, for the way we remember you, for the solo dance in your eyes, and for leaving when you got tired to the grandmothers, who were first mothers and once daughters, or better yet, women. Thank you for not being afraid of the water and for sticking around long enough to leave us with the ability to keep on swimming. Thank you. Wow. Powerful. Thank you. Hang on, let me get my yeah. Let me, words matter in life. And uh thank you. Those are amazing words. Welcome to our, our place. Thank you. Thank, you, so thank you for having me. Uh I wish I was that eloquent all the time. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you so much, man. God bless. Miss Miss uh, Miss Hayes, it looks like we have an amazing person addition to our group here. All right, um, we're going to move on to item four, which is a public comment and communications. In lieu of the extreme emergency facing our city, and in keeping with the executive order issued by the governor, the public will not be invited to physically attend this meeting but has the ability to and to view and listen to the regular meeting via live stream on the YouTube link and public comments can be made in person at the Library Service Center or submitted in writing in advance. And do we have any uh, live? Yeah, Judge, we do have uh, one patron comment that was submitted to the library's website that I will read right now with okay. your permission. Yes, of course. Okay, this comment was submitted by Joe McDermott and she says, as a patron of the library for many years, I am truly disappointed with your decision to waive all late fees. Over $2 million would have purchased many books. Yes, it may encourage people to come back to check out more books. What if they don't return those? All you are doing is encouraging people to be irresponsible. I took my children in the library to the library since that day they were born and they take their children we would never dream of keeping a library book. A very poor decision. That's it. Thank you. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, do we do we have anyone at the Library Service Center that wishes to make any comments, Jackie? Uh, there's there's nobody that has showed up at the Library Services Center. Okay. We'll move move on to item five, which is approval of the minutes executive session, regular and special meetings. First, we'll go to item 5A, the regular meeting, which was February 22nd. 
Uh, I think the meetings or the minutes were, were, uh, are enclosed. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting held on February 22nd, 2021? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, and okay, can we have a call of the roll, please, Angie? Yes, Mr. Biederman. Approve. And Dr. Jett? Approve. Dr. Murtada? Approve. Judge Salinas? Approved. Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Hang on. We do not have any, I don't think we had an executive or a special meeting in February. So we'll move on to the committee reports. Uh, item six is the finance committee. Uh, Mr. Dr. Dr. Payne is not here. Ray, how are we doing this or Jackie? Uh, we're gonna let EJ talk, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to our, the, our, big, our big gun, I got it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, report, but I'm, I'm not, there's nothing um, exciting happening in this month's report. Um, our only item is the treasurer's report for the month of February. Um, it is pretty normal. Our expenditures were a little less than this time last year. And I really think that's just a timing issue. There's nothing um, so different, except for the fact that we are not fully operational. So maybe we don't have as many supplies, but our buildings are open. Um, our utilities are approximately about the same, um, but our repairs and maintenance are lower. Um, and so I, I think that's a timing issue and we'll pick that up um, for the rest of the year. Again, I have those charts. This, um, this month we switched order around um, so that we have the oldest first. So it goes from 2019 to 2021, made a little more sense. So you can see that our expenditures overall for 2021 are a little less um, than year to date in the prior three years. Um, but again, I don't think that it's something that um, we can count on is primarily due to repairs and maintenance. And then you could see it broken out by major categories here. And our salaries are about the same. Um, benefits a little less. Um, and then each category we have a little less, uh, but repairs and maintenance is the big area. And part of it is timing. And part of it is that we're using more of our bond proceeds to take care of some items that would have traditionally come out of the operating fund. Um, so with that, if there are no questions, or I guess I'll open up the floor for any questions you may have. You should have a side question, if I may. I'm mm -hmm. just wondering if the COVID relief bill, does that offer any assistance for libraries? It does, and we're waiting to see how, um, because we will get our, um, well, there are a couple of things. They have some grants um, for, um, for connectivity um, and uh, digital access. Um, and so what we're, we're looking into what that entails, if we can get some reimbursement for Wi-Fi's and hotspots. Um, and so that's still being worked out um, through E-rate. And then we have um, an allocation possibly coming through the city um, so we're waiting to see about that as well. So we have nothing concrete, but we have possibilities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board? Well, if there are no questions, I'll ask um, that you approve this February report for audit. Okay. Is there a motion to accept the report of the treasurer for February, 2021? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion on this motion? Seeing none, Angie, can we have a call to roll, please? Mr. Biederman. Approved. Dr. Jett. Approved. Dr. Matata. Approved. Judge Salinas. Approved. Thank you. We'll move on to item seven, the Diversity Policy Human Resource Committee. Um, I'm gonna go ahead if, if, the, if the board is okay, just 
We don't have a report tonight, so I'm gonna move this report to next month, if that's okay with the board. And move on to number eight, the facilities committee, uh, Dr. Jett. Okay, yes, we have uh, two items uh, on the agenda. Uh, the first uh, is the, do you want to do the Fort Benjamin presentation? Okay, the first item will be the Fort Ben presentation by the architects. Yes, um, hi everybody, good evening. I would like to introduce Kevin Hughes with Ratio Architecture who will be uh, having a presentation. Uh, but first we're gonna hear from Kimberly Brown Harding who will be the new branch manager there. And you should have Kevin to access to control or share your screen. And there you should see it. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Great. So Kimberly? Um, yes, I'm here. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Kimberly Brown Harden, and I am the manager of the Fort Bend branch. I'm currently residing at the East 38th Street branch. Um, we've held a couple of community engagement sessions. Of course, these were virtual. The first one, we had about 22 patrons. On the second one, we had 82 patrons. Afterwards, um, a group reached out to um, reached out to participants just to kind of get more uh, feedback and what they felt. Um, how it went or things that they would like to see in case they didn't get a chance to offer any additional uh, comments. But the key takeaways is what they were looking for in this new branch, of course, is convenience. They are really excited and they want us to somehow merge the history of Fort Bend. They are looking for community spaces. They are also looking for things for children to do. They're looking for a nice children's space. They're looking for meeting and group study rooms. They're excited about the outdoor space as well as collections. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, uh, as part of the community engagement, uh, there was a short survey and there were over a thousand participants and it was like four uh, questions. As you can see here, uh, the makeup was predominantly white and female who responded and about middle age from 41 to 55. That's what those were the, the most popular groups that responded to our surveys. Uh, second was uh, African-American. Next slide, please. And what came of the two um, engagement, community engagement forums that we had, these are the things that the community is looking for. They're looking for a welcoming space, they want something that's inviting, safe, and they want comfortable. They're looking for some place that they can gather. They are really excited about having outdoor spaces. They are also looking for a place for folks who are teleworking or people who are working, um, uh, small business owners. They just want a place to be able to unwind and be able to conduct business in the library, a safe place. And I think that is it for my portion. And Sharon, shall I go ahead? Yes, okay. please. Great, and I wanna thank you all first for the opportunity, our entire ratio team and all of our uh, engineering consultants and uh, Skillman Corporation and the Davis uh, Associates, all thank you for this opportunity. It's gonna be a great project. Um, as, as Sharon might have mentioned, we've been working on this since late 2017 because we've been negotiating with the fort on the site. And uh, we finally got there earlier this year and uh, are happy finally to move this along as I'm sure you are too. Um, this is the location of the site. It's sort of in the Southeast corner of the fort, uh, sort of uh, east of Post Road, west of Lee Road and sort of southeast of the uh, park. And here's some of the major landmarks that you may recognize. If you can see my mouse, there's Post Road is here. Um, the the, the uh, inn at Port Harrison is here. Our landmark for my company or my team is Yakimo's Pizza, which is right <laughs> there. And Ivy Tech College and the YMCA are here. So this is the parcel we finally landed on. And um, 
and uh, it, it will be very much uh, a strong presence on 56th Street. That was something that your team has asked us to do. It will have a 56th Street address and it will be uh, include about 85 parking spaces. I, I should say that because it is on the fort, we do have to interact and meet the requirements of the Fort Bend Reuse Authority. And they're, they're, it's a planned urban development, so they have certain standards that they expect you to meet. They have your their own architectural review committee that we will go through. So in many ways, we have multiple clients here, you, the Fort, and the city of Indianapolis. And here you see the site plan, 56th Street, a new road called Milner, which divides the property. Uh, what's called parcel J in half. We were able to get 86 parking spaces, a drive-through, a drop-off lane for, for and also a, a service yard. Um, we, we're trying to maximize the green spaces, but the fort does require that this building hug both streets very tightly. So the fact we're in the southwest corner is not an accident. It's part of what the fort will require. Take you into the floor plan. And this is preliminary. We are in schematic design. So as you guys know, you're very seasoned in building. You've, you've gone through several projects, but this is schematic design. We're just beginning to develop the plan or our uh, construction manager is pricing it and we're trying to match scope and size and functions to your budget. So here you see we have an entrance off of the north off the parking lot, as well as an entrance off at 56th Street with a large porch-like. Uh, element that will help invite people in and, and sort of identify it as having a 56th Street presence. Um, those two entrances will connect through the marketplace and be supervised by the desk, which also can supervise the toilets, the large meeting room for 100, um, and sort of look out and see almost the entire space. Um, there will be a satellite desk down sort of anchoring children's and overlooking computers and the adult space will be off to the other side. Um, we have included several group study rooms, meeting rooms, as well as a meeting room for about 15. And as you walk in from the north, these display walls will be not only your community information displays like you have in all your branches, but, but will be a Fort Benjamin Harrison heritage display where we, they would wanna, they've asked us to show the history of the fort. And I think Jackie's donating a flag. Is that right, Jackie? <laughs> that she has that, that once flew at the fort or something like that. Um, the staff space is in this north bar. So the north bar is sort of a lower brick bar. And then the, the, the library proper will be a larger, taller, more glassy lantern-like space where you'll be able to see in from 56th Street that this is a library and that the readers will be bathed in light and have great views out as you can have at, in, on 56th Street. Um, we were able to have the, the cars pull up and drop directly to your automated handling machine as an outside book drop, an inside book drop, and your desk. All will just simply reach over, put it in, go into the machine. So we were pretty happy with achieving that in the limited space we had uh, on this site. Here you start to see our initial studies of what the building might look like. 56th Street, you see it's a very tall building. The fort requires that the buildings be two stories in height, really two and a half anywhere you build. And to be lower than that, you need a variance. So, because they're trying to build a density and a height. And so that's unusual. They, you know, you wanted a one story building, they wanted to look like a three story building. So that was one of the challenges we dealt with. But so we've added lower scale elements to kind of break down the scale for the pedestrians as they approach the building and enter it. And that also lets us within the larger space on the interior, create nooks that people can pull into and be in more intimate seating. We have that both in teens, children's and adults. I talk with my hands and then I can't click with my mouse. So there, there you see an axonometric of, of the space and how, how we envision it laying out. There you see the north entrance to the community room, uh, the staff spaces, the main library space with the teen and children's nook, a children's window seat, an activity pod, an adult reading nook that will look out to the garden, a garden area, maybe have a 
electronic fireplace. Uh, and there you see the group, uh, the study rooms and the meeting room in there. The color coding of the stacks is simply confirming your counts to what, what each of your uh, collections need to be. So we're trying to draw inspiration from the fort. It has two aspects. It has the old historic uh, army buildings, the fort buildings that are brick, white trim, uh, porches. And, uh, and then you also have the Fort Bend State Park with the natural colors, the woods, the greens, and things like that. So we are anticipating a palette that we will use both on the outside and the inside of the building that will reflect those two things, brick and natural colors. And again, we're, we're just beginning to study the outside, uh, but you can see it might begin to look something like this, that it still fits with the fort, yet it will evoke that natural feel of the, of the state park. Um, we do wanna briefly let our, our, team, our construction team, Skillman and the Davis group, Victor is going to talk for a little bit. I'll let him introduce himself and he's gonna talk about uh, budget and schedule. Victor. Thank you, Kevin. Well, good evening, board. We appreciate the chance to talk to you a little bit this evening. And I want to recognize our partner, Davis Associates. I believe Gary Davis is on the line with us as well. And uh, we've uh, hit the ground running working with Ratio and your administration um, to make sure we keep the project on budget. Uh, you have a fixed budget. Uh, it's uh, about $9.7 million, and uh, the construction cost is roughly 7.4. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, uh, we're into the schematic design phase, which is a, an early conceptual phase of the project. And so our estimates, as you can expect, are conceptual. Um, not unusual, the first pass with our estimates, we were a little over budget. And so we've been working with ratio over the last couple of weeks to right size the project to the budget. So um, this is pretty common. Uh, and so we're working with them and looking at square footage, looking at materials, looking at exterior finishes, all those things to make sure that as they move along and move forward, uh, the project aligns with your budget. And uh, uh, it won't be long before uh, the the design will be far enough along that we would like to put the project out to out to bid. Um, what's critical to understand about our schedule is that we would like to bid the project in two packages. You see here that uh, uh, we will be coming to the board with permission to request permission to bid that first package in the end of May so that we'll put the project out uh, in June, early June. Um, and bid that, or excuse me, award that package uh, in the end of July. <clears throat> uh, the, that package will primarily include structural steel and some site work components. Um, it's really important in this economy and with this schedule that we get uh, those steel bids uh, procured uh, because there's such a long time period to fabricate the steel and have it on site that. Uh, uh, we want to get that out early. We'll uh, issue the remainder of the, the project again at the end of July. So there'll be a little bit of overlap uh, and that we'll be bringing those bids and sort of our total complete project GMP to the board uh, at the end of September. Uh, that will uh, obviously allow us to, uh, I think there's tentatively an idea of a groundbreaking event in September. Of course, our Substantial completion goal then is uh, we have about roughly 13 months of construction. So that is in December. And of course, the ultimate uh, driver for all this schedule is to have the ability to open the uh, new branch for public services in that first quarter of, of 2023. That's a quick overview of our schedule and budget and happy to answer any questions the board might have. Thank you, Victor. And I want to add that we had targeted the building to be about 25,000 square feet. We're currently a little under 22,000 square feet. And that's intentional because we're trying to protect that budget. We don't think in today's very volatile construction environment, we are seeing certain trades and certain materials uh, increase substantially. We were in another meeting just minutes before this one where we heard that, that raw lumber is up 
double, triple, quadruple, but steel is also becoming a big issue now. So we know that, you know, you have a limited amount of money. So we're sort of making sure that the project is as tight as it can be. We believe we're meeting all of your functional requirements. Um, and, and we certainly won't shrink the building anymore without your, your committee's approval to do so. Um, I also want to mention that once you approve this, we intend to have another community meeting in early to mid April, where we roll the design out to the community and let them have input back to us on, at that time. So are there any questions? Any questions on board? Thank you, folks. No, no questions. Thank you, I don't Kevin. have any questions at this time. Um, appreciate the schematic design and the concepts. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yes, thank you. Dr. Jeb, are we gonna to go to item B or did you need a motion on, on item, item A? No. Okay. Um, yes, there's a, uh, our next item is um, an amended resolution um, to address um, the need to find a contractor for our lawn and landscape care. So I will have Sharon discuss that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so item 8B is a resolution to approve, to award a services contract for lawn and landscaping services. We did make a recommendation to the facilities committee uh, to award this to schoolboy landscaping. And there were too many questions that the facilities committee had for us to feel comfortable moving forward with, for them to feel comfortable moving forward with this resolution. Um, so this is a resolution that includes services to all of our locations. And the RFP was released to allow multiple vendors to submit proposals for different service areas. Um, Schoolboy did come in the lowest for all of those service areas, but the concern, there were, there were, like I say, several concerns that we need some time to explore and get more information back to the facilities committee before we're comfortable uh, moving this forward. So um, the amended resolution that you have is not to confirm the selection committee's recommendation. However, it is one that allows the facilities committee to uh, receive more information about the proposals and to be able to um, be able to decide based on the selection committee's input which um, services will be accepted. And I guess I would ask maybe Russell at this point to describe maybe in a little more detail, this is a little unusual for how we handle resolutions. And Russell, if you could please share the um, ability for us to do this and how that, how that works. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so what we've drafted in this amended resolution is, is what Sharon described. Essentially, you are sending this back to the facilities committee uh, for the, the collection of additional information. But given the time sensitivity of needing to uh, engage in lawn care and landscaping services, uh, you are effectively um, delegating the ability of, uh, to make a final decision on this to the facilities committee. So after they've received the additional information, they would uh, make that recommendation and allow for preliminary contract negotiations and a preliminary determination to move forward subject to your ratification. So I think the, con the, the concept would be uh, let the facilities committee go through their process, get their questions answered, uh, make a come to a determination, uh, and then authorize the CEO to go ahead and move forward with engaging those contract discussions and negotiations. Ultimately, there would be a, a follow-up resolution in uh, April, which would be just effect effectively the board ratifying the actions of the facilities committee. So uh, that, that was our uh, attempt to keep this moving forward, not take an entire month uh, and let grass grow and or grass need fertilizing uh, during that time, uh, but also to be responsive to the questions that the facilities committee raised. Dr. Jed, any comments on it or discussion? I'm, I'm going to open up to the board because I have a few I have a few things I want to say. But did you want to add anything, Dr. Jed? 
Uh, no, not, not yet. Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and ask for a motion second, then we can have discussions on the motion, OK? Uh, is there a motion to approve the amended uh, resolution 14 2021? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, I'm going to open up for discussion, and if it's okay, I'm going to start. Um, considering that, at least from my position, considering the, the time-sensitive nature uh, that was outlined by the by the, the committee and by Mr. Brown, uh, I'm okay with taking the. At least I, I'm going to approve for vote in favor of this of this process. Um, I think we should always have the full board vote on any resolutions uh, uh, or contracts, things of that nature, but. Uh, considering the fact pattern that we have before us, the fact that the committee wanted some more information, but it is time sensitive. I personally uh, will approve or vote to approve this amendment, but I, I don't think we should make, uh, this should be some a course of action that we, that we take lightly. Any other discussion from the board or comments? Yeah. Well, please. Oh, okay, go ahead, Ray. I, I was gonna say, I agree and um, thank you um, to the committee for taking a close look at this. Um, just on its face, there seems to be a pretty big disparate number between the lowest bid and the second lowest bid, about 24% by my estimation. And so there's either a scoping issue or something else going on that, that we probably need to take a closer look at. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, you're right on point, Ray. That's one of the reasons why in the facilities committee, we asked for some more information. It, it just seems like such a huge discrepancy, but we also know that the law, the grass will continue to grow. And so we need to get it going as soon as possible. Uh, Terry first raised the question and all of us, you know, as we looked at it, we thought this is a major uh, discrepancy. So thank you. Yeah, that was uh, what I was going to suggest was that actually that was our point was that we wanted the full board to actually take a look um, at it and to not make the decision um, as the smaller uh, facilities committee. Um, so no, that's I all think, I wanted to add. No, I think the committee, I think was prudent. Um, any further discussion on the amended amendment? Seeing none or hearing none. Angie, can we have a call the roll, please? Mr. Biederman. Approved. Dr. Jett? Approved. Dr. Matata? Approved. Judge Salinas? Approved. Thank you. The motion carries. We'll move on to Strategic Planning Committee, Dr. Jett. Yes. Um, and so excited to present Garrett, who will present our final strategic plan. Hello. Good evening, uh, board members. Um, thank you, Dr. Jett. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, I think, just to, so we can scroll and roll through this. Um, okay, so here, I'm just going to uh, quickly, fairly quickly roll through um, yeah, our plan. Garrett, your screen's not sharing. Yeah, it's sure. not sharing. No, sir. How about now? That's Sharon now? Much okay, better. good. Okay, sorry. Uh, I have to, you have to double click, not just one click. Remember, remember. It's only been a year since I've been doing this, right? So I should I should know that with the Zoom. But uh, all right, so here's uh, our front page of the um, of our new strategic plan. And I um, want to give a lot of um, thanks to to Joe and his work on, on the look and feel of the document. Uh, Joe played a big, big part in, in the visual representation of what you're going to see and, and tearing through our, our many, many, many photos and trying to find ones that fit and represented us and, and everything. So big thanks to uh, the communications team for, for helping us with that and working with our developer. So um, this is Martindale Brightwood. Um, the next photo is also of Martindale Brightwood. And these were um, uh, those were pre-pandemic, I think, Joe, is that right? Pre-pandemic or post-pandemic, but um, staged for... Post-pandemic, post but sort of staged for, uh, yeah. For yeah, safety. Were, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so we have um, what, what you see in most strategic plans and what was the case with the last one, an opening uh, statement. 
um, by uh, Judge Salinas and, and um, our CEO. It's just talking about um, where we're at and, and where we want to go as an organization um, that we want to do it with the community. Um, and we want to involve every, everyone in all aspects of the communities as we, as we move through um, the next three years of our organizational journey. And then here's a, a big part of the meat of the plan. So um, this, if you recall, the, the display of the racial equity um, and our values was a little bit different. Racial equity was in the middle. We had uh, spokes, if you will, going off toward the other values. And the, the designer came up with this and Joe tightened it up. And I really like this. I think it conveys the message nightly, nicely um, that we want racial equity to be a driving force in everything we do. Uh, a driving force in each part of our values, as well as a value in and of itself. So that's a nice clean visual. And then we go into sections with our uh, strategic priorities and then the objectives tied to each of those priorities. Uh, so that we have our, our racial equity uh, partnerships. We have our information and literacy. So the five areas of um, information and literacies that we'll be focusing on. And so each of those has their own, their own section as well. Same setup with a summary and then the strategic objectives. So you guys have seen all this content before. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the, I'm going through the content. And then uh, new, some new stuff. Um, some new information and content that you, you might not have seen before um, is our, we want to talk about some of our other initiatives that aren't directly tied into the specific objectives, but are, are very important to us um, and, and very large initiatives um, and, and, and tasks that will be undertaken in the next three years. So the first part of that is talking about our, our partnership with the Library Foundation and some of the big initiatives we have going on, the Digital Encyclopedia of Indianapolis, the racial equity training for NDPL staff, and then uh, our sustainability plan and working with the foundation to, to develop a, a good solid sustainability plan for the CBLC. And then the next section, the next few pages is talking about our capital projects. So we have the West Perry branch, then we have uh, Glendale, Fort Bend, which we just got a nice, uh, a nice update on how that's going to look. And then the redesign of the learning curve. Um, so all these things that of course we want to um, have accomplished by the end of the strategic plan, which would sunset at the end of 2023. And then after our capital projects, there's just a, um, a statement by me uh, talking about the process and acknowledging everyone that helped and, and everyone that contributed and guided the process, including um, our board committee, our um, staff steering committee, and then just thanking those groups and, and the full board for its support as we move through the process, as well as some of our uh, community partners that I talked to uh, at length regarding uh, our priority areas that were identified through our community surveys, um, and those are listed um, right here in, in the in the statement. So Kepper, Edna Martin, then we're at Welcome Center, Hawthorne Center, Latin, Latino Youth Collective, La Plaza, and Flanner House. So I, I had in-depth conversations with them talking about our priority. So wanted to make sure um, we thanked everyone. And then the last page with any content is just the list of our, our committees and um, and the board. So that is uh, that's our, our new strategic plan for the next um, three years, two years and eight months, give or take. So any questions about anything in there? Some of that, uh, the added content, of course, outside the, the meet uh, would have been new uh, to some members on the board, such as the capital projects and the um, foundational piece. So any questions about any of that? No questions. It looks wonderful. Is it just going to be remain digital or are they going to be actually printed copies? Yeah, they're going to be printed copies. And, and Joe, if you want to speak to that more, but the, the, because of the time. Oh. Um, they, they came in on Friday. I was really trying to get them to you guys oh. meeting and uh, they came in like late on Friday afternoon. So we'll make sure get that. These are going to be out at branches. We're going to pass these things out. Like, you know, I mean, uh, 
it'll be in everyone's hands, but uh, I want an autographed it. copy. Now the question is, who's going to autograph it? I guess Garrett's <laughs> the one that needs to autograph it, right? I mean, he was the. <laughs> I, know, I do like. Dr. Like Jeff was the committee yeah. chair, so I feel like you know you could have a few autographs on the front. <laughs> That's right. I, I, do, I do like there the light blue and the and the light green colors. It's not over dominating. I think it's it, it goes well. Well, and, and, and we specifically and, and intentionally, uh, and Roberta, I think we'll get to this when, when she comes up, but it, it mirrors in style the foundations plan. So cool. they look like they kind of go hand in hand and they do. So um, so that was a design uh, approach that we had as well. Oh, smart. Thank you. Are you saying it's already been printed? Yeah, we they, they, they showed up on Friday and I've got uh, like 2,500 of these in the next room over. Here at it's so, so funny be... because in, in the new content that we didn't get a chance to see, uh, Terry and Garrett, no, I do, I do a lot of editing. <laughs> and so I was reading and I saw which this and which that, and I said, mm, should have had gerunds in there. There should have been gerunds in there. <laughs> this looks so great. No, nobody no. else, nobody else but an editor of a journal would give no. a rat, a, it would yeah. care. We don't need typo <laughs> checks right now. <laughs> no, it I, looks so good. Thank you so very much, Terry and the committee and all the work that you've done. Just did a great job. Thank you. Yes. Good job, guys, on the committee. Thank, Thank you, Garrett. Thank you. Uh, Dr. J, any more as far as uh, your committee report? No. And I say the committee is now officially disbanded right you mean i won't get a chance to continue to meet with you <laughs> oh we can meet just not about that <laughs> all right folks move on to item 10 the library foundation report uh Ms. Jaggers, welcome. hello everybody thanks so much for having me tonight um, pleasure to be here so i'm going to tick through our general report very quickly and um let me see is my screen being shared right now no i'm just in a i'm just in a funky view let me just Sorry, guys, let me gallery view. Okay, so let me um, first just tick through some of the basic stuff in our report, and then I will share our strategic plan. So um, basically, uh, last month we had about 147 donors who made gifts to the Library Foundation, and our biggest ones were the Crystal DeHaan Family Foundation, Indiana University School of Medicine, Lacey Foundation, Lilly Endowment, Inc., and Rich Charles. And so if you happen to have any encounters with any of these organizations, uh, please feel free to help us thank them. And then the other thing that we, we provided last month was about 65, or rather this month, excuse me, we're providing about $65,000 for library programs and initiatives. And so some of the larger initiatives are the early literacy specialist, the ready to read or reading ready initiative now. So that suite of early childhood programs, um, general dig digitization efforts, um, the preschool programs that, that are part of the Reading Ready, the McFadden Lecture, and World Language Computer Classes. So there was our, those are classes that are offered in Spanish and Arabic, which is really cool. And so that is our basic report. And before I get into the strategic plan of the foundation, does anybody have any questions about that basic stuff? Okay. Well, I will share my screen and here we go. Okay. So again, um, I wanna just say a couple thank yous getting started here. First of all, um, Jackie and, and TD Robinson were members of our strategic planning committee and Garrett attended all of our meetings as well and provided some great input from time to time. And this was really important because this helped to assure continuity between the library's plan and the foundation's plan. We wanted to make sure that our plan was relevant and responsive to what the library is doing. And I think you'll see that reflected throughout the plan. Um, and then also just many thanks to, I've had meetings with several other members of the library's executive team, especially EJ and John to help um, determine what, what are the highest priority funding needs so far as we could tell right now. And I'm Jackie, of course, as well was part of those conversations. And then also finally, um, Joe really helped us a lot with just getting ours professionally designed and printed. So we do have a printed copy also that we'll um, get to you all if you, if you would like a printed copy of, of our plan as, as well. So we're really proud of it. It's the first time we've had our plan professionally designed. 
So now that we're uh, there, we'll get into the substance of the plan. And so uh, you can see here our cover. And then uh, we really wanted to have a lot of photos and you can see how the design elements to the transparent squares and the, and the color blocks um, help us. But you know, our, our vision is to empower the library to be the center of knowledge, community, life, and innovation for Indianapolis through the community's generosity. And our mission is to partner with donors to enrich lives, foster lifelong learning, engage our diverse community through the library. And so we very intentionally aligned these because we don't have our own agenda except to do a great job of stewarding, raising and stewarding the donations that the library needs to achieve its mission to the community. So we really wanted to talk about our end, end result, which is really a thriving library system that lifts up the people of our community. And so our values are service, innovation, collaboration, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And service is about our relationship with our donors, the library, and the community. Innovation is about having a growth mindset, constantly look, looking to see, um, to learn, grow, and improve, and to be thinking about the future. Um, collaboration is just really important in, in terms of how we approach our relationship with the library and our donors for the betterment of the community. And then diversity, equity, inclusion is we value all people and perspectives and support opportunities for everyone to thrive. And so there are some things that we're going to be doing on a personal and individual level, but ultimately we're, our goal is to raise money for a variety of library initiatives that you know, provide opportunities for everyone to thrive. Um, and, and so that, that's also reflected in, in our goals in terms of fundraising and what we want to be able to provide for the library. So we have three goals and then underneath each goal we have objectives and tactics. And so rather, I'm not going to go through and read each goal, um, but I'll go in a little bit more detail because um, I know that this is a new document to all of you. So the first goal is about having a strong working relationship with the library, really nurturing that relationship and aligning our support, our priorities with the library's priorities. And so on this one, there was a lot of coordination with the library and we identified like three, three different areas. Like what are things that we're already raising money for on an annual basis? that needs to continue or increase a little bit. So in children's, we feel like just from the past few years of going through all the children's fund requests, we realized that we haven't had as much money to fund all of those as we would have liked. So that's why we came up with a, with a goal here to increase that. Um, and then the other, the other thing is that we know that there are some things that we're going to have to do new that, you know, like for example, we have a grant from Lilly Endowment right now to fund the CBLC for a while longer, but what happens when that grant goes out? Um, so thinking about that, and then also the idea of maintaining support for the general programs that we fund, like everything from the author lectures to the job centers, to the computer classes, to the meet the artists, to, you know, the list goes on and on. So we wanna maintain support for those sorts of things. We also wanna be a good partner in helping the library to, um, develop the Digital Encyclopedia of Indianapolis with Polis Center. So we are working on that. And we also want to raise um, funding for the getting all of the library staff or as many of library staff as possible over the next three years into the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Institute that Pat Payne has organized. And I attended that myself and our foundation staff are going through that right now. It's very worthwhile. And soon um, we'll be able to announce some funding, some major funding we've received to help us with this, uh, this, this, this item here. So we're very excited about that. Um, and then also just getting back to our service for the library. And so the library is our customer, just like the community is our customer. And we wanna be responsive to the library's needs. And we also wanna be easy to work with. I mean, we're kind of like a hot potato because there's a lot of extra work that goes into stewarding private gifts, um, you know, and it's, it can get kind of complicated um, tracking all the donors and their restrictions. And that kind of goes to the library when, they're, when we're spending, giving them money to deploy for programs. And so we always just wanna keep working with, with the library and making sure that we're as easy to work with as we possibly can be. Um, and then uh, we have just one of like an example of a major metric that we would track for this area. So our next goal really is laying out our fundraising plan or fundraising goals, not our fundraising plan, but what are the areas that we really need to raise more money in in order to be a more sustainable and growth oriented 
organization. And so we've set some goals for that, for what we wanna raise for unrestricted giving um, and that corresponding with a reduction in draws from our investments and endowments. Also, we have goals for how much more we wanna raise for children's programming. Um, you know, we have a, we're beginning to um, early stages of implementing a fundraising plan for the Center for Black Literature and Culture, which I'd be uh, prepared to talk with you all about another time, but that's something that's very much in the works. Um, continuing to raise money for special projects and developing our annual fundraising event, which is Circulate Night at the Library. And there are some more great pictures and then also building our endowment. And then our third goal has to do with um, developing and prioritizing a culture that promotes personal growth, effectiveness, and fulfillment for board members, volunteers, and staff. And this is where a lot of our institutional level racial equity goals are. So we've analyzed our board and we've realized that we're um, underrepresented, people of color are underrepresented on our board and males are underrepresented on our board as two groups. So we've, we have a goal to increase that representation um, which is in proportion to the number of spaces we have available coming up over the next few years. We also, um, it's harder to set actual um, goals for our staff because there are only eight of us and you know we don't even know, we don't even have enough people to have a regular number of openings, but we do want to do some reflection on what would be appropriate goals, you know, based upon the diversity of the community and the diversity of our fields. And, and also when we have, when we're able to recruit volunteers for other purposes to be intentional about um, diverse groups there. Um, we also just want to provide an annual educational opportunity for our board members, volunteers and staff. And then next year we, we plan to hire a consultant to help us to review our policies and practices through a DEI lens. So to help us identify what are some opportunities we have to be more equitable that we're overlooking because they're in our blind spot. So we wanna do that. Um, there's a lot in here about maximizing board member effectiveness in fundraising on behalf of the library. So there's a lot about just paying attention to our staffing and making sure everyone has adequate professional development and that you know we have an adequate staff. And so those are basically the key tenets of our strategic plan and the things that we are going to work with. Um, the last thing I'll just say is that it's a little, uh, it's a little different for us to put our, our numerical goals out there like this, but we just think that if we're really direct about what we need, that that's gonna inspire the greatest action or support towards the foundation. And then the goals are also really ambitious. So we might, we've, we've talked with the board about, you know, we, we are committed to these goals and we're committed to developing a fundraising plan, which will lay out the specific steps for what we think is necessary to achieve these goals. But of course, when you're talking about fundraising, all kinds of things can happen outside of our control. And so we, we feel like as a board and a staff, what we've decided is that we will hold ourselves accountable to our actions and, that, and fulfilling the, the action plans we develop. And um, you know we think that we will at the very least, land a lot higher than we would have if we had set easy goals that and, and exceeded them. You know, so we're trying to um, really just be realistic about our, our goals, but we do think they are achievable if we work really hard and get a little lucky. So um, those are those are that's so that's basically our philosophy on on that. And again, I think we're just really excited about being able to support the library in such a public way in such a strong way. And you know, we'll be sharing lots of the library strategic plan with donors as well, especially over the next year when it's new information to a lot of them. And then the only other thing I'll say is that we're collaborating with the library on a plan to um, actually um, distribute, um, promote our strategic plans and make them available to everybody. So that's all I have here. I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? Seeing them, Ms. Chagos, thank you so much for your You're report. Welcome. I appreciate yes, that. My pleasure. Yep, thank you. We'll move on to item number 11, the report of the CEO, Chagos. Thank you, President Salinas. Uh, this evening, the main item that I have is our routine resolution regarding finances, personnel, and travel. This month, this is resolution 15 2021. Uh, there is no travel on the resolution. We're still doing everything virtually. And uh, we do have a few personnel changes on there, nothing um, 
nothing particularly unusual this month. So I would submit this for your approval. Okay. Um, is there a motion to approve resolution 15, 2021? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion from the board on the resolution? Seeing none. Angie, can we have a call to roll, please? Mr. Biederman. Approved. Dr. Jett. Approved. Dr. Matata. Approved. Jet Salinas. Approved. Thank you. Motion carries. Item B, Jackie? Yes. This is the, an item that we thought would be of importance to all of you. There are several bills moving through the state legislature that concern the ability of boards like our library board to continue to have virtual meetings. And so I've been tracking this legislation along with the help of Robert Scott and Russell Brown the Indiana Library Federation is working very hard on this legislation, and we thought it would be important to provide you with a brief update at this point, knowing that the session's not over yet, but it would be good at least for you to have some sense of the status of this. So I would ask Russell to share with us the most recent information. Thank you. Um, so there are two bills uh, that are dealing with electronic communication at public meetings. So they amend the open door law as it currently exists. Uh, the bills are, there's a house bill and a Senate bill. Uh, both have passed their, their chamber of origin. So they have uh, passed the full house or passed the full Senate and then moved on to the second house. Uh, the Senate bill appears uh, is not not been yet scheduled for a hearing in the house uh, so the house bill appears to be the one that's moving uh, most likely it passed out of committee actually uh, today uh, so this is relatively current information um, a couple things that are important for for everything uh, for everyone to to be mindful of that exist in both bills um, and a lot of this does align with other uh, boards or governing bodies that are currently allowed to meet remotely or have a portion of their members meet remotely. Uh, but uh, the big things uh, that we've been tracking through this um, are obviously you have to have the ability uh, to this to continue to be able to simultaneously communicate with each other, which obviously uh, these mechanisms continue to have been able to do so. Uh, <clears throat> they. Um, the, the governing body, uh, meaning you, will have to adopt a written policy to establish procedures uh, that deal with this. So that includes you know, uh, uh, the number of meetings that can be uh, attended virtually uh, in a year. Um, it can deal with how you communicate uh, about that attendance, uh, how you, uh, some of the record keeping that goes along with that, uh, that attendance and the contemplated uh, attendance. Uh, also, um, it's important to note that both of these pieces of legislation do require that at least 50% of the members of the governing body must be present for a meeting. So it does not allow a 100% virtual meeting like you've uh, been able to, uh, to utilize uh, as the open door law has been uh, been suspended through the emergency orders of the governor. Uh, so that would be a change uh, for your board. That would mean at least four members would need to be uh, in attendance, uh, physically in attendance for a meeting. Um, a member would have to attend at least 50% of the meetings in a calendar year. Uh, so there was an obligation as it relates to attendance, um, unless there's absences due to illness, et cetera. But uh, you couldn't uh, one member couldn't virtually participate in seven meetings in a year uh, and they would have to participate physically uh, in at least 50% of those calendar meetings. Um, and then uh, there are some uh, restrictions as it relates to number of meetings, consecutive meetings that you could uh, attend virtually as well. So uh, currently it says that uh, the Legislation currently provides that two meetings would be the maximum number of meetings consecutively that you could attend. You would have to then attend a meeting in person and then you could uh, continue that, that two additional meetings. Um, there are uh, in the House bill and the Senate bill, there are some differences. Um, and we've been communicating as recently as today uh, with the 
<clears throat> Indiana Library Foundation or, um, Federation uh, as it relates to uh, some of these differences because some of them could be very meaningful uh, to the actual ability of the library to hold uh, an effective meeting virtually. Uh, so some of those would have limitations on the types of meetings uh, that could be for virtual attendance or the ability to vote virtually uh, could be allowed. Uh, one of them, one that's most concerning uh, relates to uh, personnel matters. Uh, there's some language that's been modified a couple times already, but uh, the language currently provides that any time that you would have a final action related to a reduction in personnel, that only those in person could be counted towards quorum and could be vote on that matter. So that is uh, obviously uh, given, for example, the resolution you just passed, which arguably uh, does have personnel actions in it, which you take each month, uh, that could be a situation where uh, it could be very difficult to effectively meet uh, as a library board and take those actions on a monthly basis with remote participation. So we've addressed, we've raised that concern uh, to the to uh, the Indiana Library Foundation, specifically uh, in your instance of how you operate on a monthly basis, you know, uh, ratifying the actions of the CEO uh, for the previous month. So um, just as a reminder, uh, committee reports uh, are not due out until uh, the uh, second week in April, you still have the ability to have second amendment readings uh, in the opposite house. And then you have uh, the uh, very enjoyable and action packed uh, time of conference committee that occurs in the weeks before uh, signee die occurs. Uh, signee die is, is uh, had been bumped up, anticipated to be bumped up uh, to I believe the 22nd of April is the anticipated end of session. Um, and so, Assuming that there's going to be a piece of legislation that moves forward, uh, there, there will be action uh, and probably a little guidance given to uh, necessary from the board about how to proceed moving through the creation of that written policy. Um, assuming that you would want to do something like that, uh, it could be a, an opportunity to utilize the policy committee to start creating those, even though we won't know the, the final language uh, like, likely in time for you to take action in it on it in April, uh, but you could uh, contemplate taking action on it as quickly as possible after the final legislation is approved and assume it's uh, signed by the governor. Um, we do anticipate, you know, the, as you know, the ability to utilize uh, remote meetings has been continued on a 30 day rolling basis uh, since last March uh, through authorization from the governor's continuation of an emergency order um, that, that expires here in the next week, I believe. Uh, and so we would anticipate that that may be extended one more additional time. Uh, there are still some, we, we understand there to be some federal dollars associated with some of those uh, continued uh, emergency declarations. So it's, it's potential that you would have the ability through that uh, ongoing emergency declaration to continue to meet remotely for your April meetings. But at that point, it would probably be a situation where you need to adopt uh, your new governing, your new written policy so that you could allow a limited uh, virtual or uh, remote participation going forward. So that was more than brief. I apologize for uh, being long winded, but uh, you know, you have to, you do have bills moving. We do anticipate something will come out. Uh, hopefully it's something that's functional and can be utilized uh, by this board. Russell, if I may, uh, I'm assuming that if, if we have the ability to do partial uh, Zoom meetings for some of our board members, that means we have to have live attendance by the public, correct? Yeah, and, and I think it goes a little further than that too. Um, it may actually require uh, the ability for the public to interact in real time through your Zoom, through your Zoom platform or through whatever virtual platform. And so it would be slightly different than the setup that you've currently utilized, uh, but many boards have boards and city councils and other bodies that I regularly participate in front of have managed that ability. It is different than what you are currently utilizing. So there would uh, potentially need to be modification for both public uh, in-person participation as well as public participation via your electronic. 
Does the board does the board have any questions? We we many, will be happy many, to keep many questions arise. <laughs> You know, as we think about the implications for public, just like you said, Russell, and uh, questions about, you know, how do we make sure that a larger public is aware of the guidelines too, you know, because we have to make sure that the public is um, uh, notified. We have to make sure that everyone is conscious of the kinds of things that are impacting who we each have in terms of comorbidity issues or anything else. So how do we play out all of the pros and cons and differences and things like that? The questions just keep popping in my mind as you were talking. Dr. Jettery. Um, yeah, I, I agree that, so I'm looking at the house version of the bill right now and it is it is a little unclear with regard to what the definition of participate as applicable to members of the public I mean, that's, that seems, it, it seems like the language needs to be tweaked a little bit. Yeah, so that that's, we've not focused as much on, on that aspect of it, but can, can spend a little more time looking at that. We've spent our time looking at how you as the board uh, are able to uh, participate or, or what regulations uh, work on that, uh, yeah. on that front. Um, but we and can, that's appreciated uh, very much, Russell. I'm sorry, you were no, saying. No, we, no we that can, part is very much appreciated. But since we are so much public facing, how do we really honor that piece too and make sure that the public, um, that we're thinking about how that interaction occurs? Like yeah, and, and we, we can continue to work on, on looking at that and working with the you know staff on, on IT needs and, and the technology needs so that it could be functional. So you could have the ability to have that public interaction, um, that real time public interaction. My only question is just about safety protocols, mask, yeah. wearing, distancing. There's a lot of things that come into play, you're right. I mean, are we gonna be do our roaming uh, visit, visit, visiting branches? Some of those branches, which I love, some of those branches real small rooms. And so there's a lot of aspects and, and how do we, so that you're right, Dr. Jed. I'm, I fully anticipate wearing masks in, in there, and I've not been vaccinated because uh, you don't know the public whether they have or not. You can't ask, uh, you can't require. Uh, I think obviously, Russell, we're going to comply by the rules and take full advantage of them. I fully anticipate we're going to be live probably by May or June, in some aspect. Uh, allow board members to to be here uh, remotely. Uh, either on a rotating basis or those that 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 needed them that we needed or wanted the most, but we have to look at: Are we going to continue the rotating, visiting different branches? Because I prefer, especially if we're obligated, and I, and I and I mean obligated, not in a bad way. If we if the public is, has a right to come and they do, I prefer to have the biggest space we can, and that's the central downtown, either the central uh, downtown library. Personally, that's that's what I prefer. And, and I can share too, I mean, some of my experience throughout the state that there are technology infrastructure needs that would need to be made to have that ability uh, in, in various places. And so there are stuff that can be you know, picked up and transported that could be utilized for some of those things, but that's gonna require some infrastructure investment and to make sure that that's available. So that might not be functional, at least as you get this policy up and going, you may have to make some of those modifications going forward. So there, there's a lot of things to consider from a legality perspective of what keeps you legal and keeps us all uh, you know, uh, on the up and up there, but as well as what the requirements are from a functionality perspective. Well, who's on the policy committee, Jackie? Um, the, policy, let's see, the policy committee is um, TD and Curtis and Pat Payne. Russell, if you can get them examples of uh, policies that people, other groups have used as far as, um, you know, uh, Zoom and uh, quasi Zoom or a mixture of Zoom and, and public, so they can get an idea of what, what, what it looks like. Yeah, we, we, I can reach out to some of the municipalities. I've done, you know, zoning hearings and those things around the state of how they've managed that. And then some of the additional policy will be driven by what the ultimate statute looks like. Yes, of course. Um, but we can we can start roughing together, 
you know, some of those things as it's appropriate, uh, you know, so that you can hit the ground running in May and, and have something. Yeah. Jackie, is, is the chair TTD or Curtis or? It's Curtis. Uh, it's Curtis. Okay. If the board's okay, I'm going to reach out to him and let him know that this could be a priority for me. Um, so if, if the law goes into effect immediately, we we're able to utilize that as, as fast as we can. And it's very possible that we will end up focusing our meetings at Central where we have the easiest opportunity to use the kind of technology that allows both remote um, participation and on site while still getting you the largest room. I agree. It allows us to stay connected with friends and family. I agree. I agree. Any other comments by the board on this? Thank you, Russell. I appreciate that, sir. Jackie, anything on anything else in your report? No, President Salinas, that's all I have for this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, does anyone have anything as far as future potential agenda items? Um, I think our next board meeting is April 26. For now, I'm saying virtual, hopefully. Um, does anyone have anything for the good of the cause? I just want to vote for a virtual meeting. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Listen, I'm in favor of having something in place that people, if we have to have three or three or four in live, I'm good with that. And if someone wants to be virtual, I'm fine with that too. All right, guys, thank you so much. Be safe uh, and enjoy your, be safe and enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Bye-bye.